Luke 2, 1 through 20. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Cornelius was governor of Syria. Everybody went to their own towns to register. So Joseph went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the child to be born. It was her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloth and placed him in a manger because there's no guest room available for them. Nearby, there were shepherds taking care of their flocks at night. An angel appeared to them and said, I have great news to you and everybody. Today, they were terrified. Today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. You'll, it will be, be assigned to you. You'll find a baby wrapped in cloth and lying in a manger. Right then, a great company of the heavenly host appeared to him and said, Glory to God in the highest heavens, and on peace, on earth peace to those whose favor rest. After the angels went up back in heaven, they said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that the Lord has done, said. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby that was lying in a manger. They spread the word concerning what had been told to them about him. Everybody who heard it was amazed. But Mary treasured and pondered all these things up in her heart. The shepherds left, glorifying and praising God for all the things he had done. And it happened exactly how he had said. Christmas for me always started with the nativity. And so... After Thanksgiving, mom was adamant. You couldn't decorate for Christmas until after Thanksgiving. And so we were there. (laughs) Okay, yeah, we we know you're here. And so after Thanksgiving, that was time to, you know, a couple days after, that was time to get everything out of the attic. And it was always my job. She would pull out this box. We'd go up in the attic. She'd pull this box out. It always, it was the same box. It had uh, this nativity. They were always wrapped in... um, you know, newspaper like this, and we would set it up. The Christmas tree was always in the good living room. Now, I don't know why it's called the good living room, but we had a, anybody else have a good living room? Okay, I don't know. We had a good living room, and I would go out there, and I would just carefully, you know, and I I took great joy in figuring out, you know, uh, okay, the wise men, they're coming in, you know, the the shepherds there, one's bended knee, you know, there's Mary and Joseph kind of setting them up, and I, I took care to, to do this right. And so really at the beginning of the Christmas season, when we would begin to celebrate it, it was like all attention on the nativity. Like that was the focus. That's the only thing that was under that tree. Now the good living room also had the front door to it. And so when people would come to visit us, they would ring the doorbell to that front door. And, and you know, as the December progresses, they would bring gifts. You know, they would come and they would fruit baskets and And just different gifts. So so as the days, you know, continued on, gifts would begin to pile up around this tree. And when you would wake up Christmas morning and Santa had come and you're a little eight-year-old boy, I run in there and, and all you see is just gifts. The, the nativity's covered up. There's, there's no focus on Jesus. And this has become a metaphor to me throughout my life uh, of how we, we start things with Jesus, but they end with us. We, we really quickly move the attention to us and what do we receive and, and the hectic and the chaos and the, the complications of this season. And so we're in a series at Harris Creek, if you're a guest with us, we're wrapping up a series today called It's Complicated, where we're celebrating this season. And today I want to look at the story that Weston read to us and talk about the complications that they felt, the complications that they experienced, but also the complications that you and I are living in right now as we celebrate the Christmas season. It can feel like this day has been hijacked by an overweight man in a hat, you know, in a red suit. And and in fact, there's a yard here in Waco where they have all of the inflatables, yeah, like all the the Christmas inflatables. And so they've got the the red man in the suit with the hat. What's his name? 
Yeah, you know his name. And then, and then they got the reindeer with the red nose. What's his name? That's right. And then they have the snowman. The snowman, what's his name? And then there's the green guy from Dr. Seuss, Cindy Lou Who's friend. The Grinch. And then right there, beside all of those other characters, is Mary, Joseph, and the one whose birthday it is. That's right, Jesus. But I want you to know, not all of those are created equal. Okay, those are not, it's not like a level playing field. They're Santa and, and Rudolph and Jesus. No, 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 no. That's, that's our cultural culture. This day is all about that baby. This day is all about that baby. And so that's what I hope to do as we move through this text is just to bring your attention to what distracts us, what complicates us. Even tomorrow, even the next day, as we move into celebrating this baby, what tries to steal our attention from it? What makes Christmas complicated? And I feel it. Like I thought before, I just don't want to play any games. Like I got here, I was 15 minutes late here. I was like, okay, he, mom had to bring him separate. He was getting a haircut by the time we were supposed to be here still. And, and I, was, I was short with Hannah, my, my friend, we partnered. I was short with Joe, you know, and I'm just like, it's crazy. It's hectic. It's chaotic. Ah, it's Christmas. I, Dale, last week, if you were here, he was, he was talking about how busy this time is and he was reading my mail he's like we have basketball practices check you know Christmas cards ours haven't even gotten to us yet they got there yesterday like our Christmas cards that we're going to send to you guys we got them yesterday okay that they showed up in the mail yesterday I've got presents that I don't know where they're at they're lost in the you know United States postal system somewhere travel like, hey, we gotta, you know, let's figure out a time to see your parents and your cousins and my parents and my siblings and, and how do we fit all of that in? And I feel that. I feel that. And, and God is like, hey, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm projecting on him, you know, which, praise God, he's not like me. But I'm just like, it's his birthday. I feel like we tried to take his birthday and made it our birthday. Try to make this about us. And so how can we bring our attention back to the one who came to save us? I'm going to look at the story West and Red, and I'm going to talk about the complications from the story, and what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to teach you something. I hope you learned something about a story that you've heard probably hundreds of times, and um, and then I'm going to talk about how we have complications that are similar to the ones that they faced at that time. Now, I'm not trying to read us into the text. I'm just trying to make a comparison to us uh, because I think you probably feel some of that stress. I'm going to try to do it in, in a short time because I know we have lots of kids here. But all of those complications are going to be represented by a gift. And so I'll kind of bring you out a gift and we'll talk through the complications and, and I'll hopefully teach you something from the text. And so let me read to you Luke 2. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius, Weston said Cornelius, was governor of Syria. And everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Bethlehem, I'm sorry, from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David. Because he belonged to the house and line of David, he went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. Luke, he is a legit historian, secular atheist historians uh, read Luke's writings as credible sources to understand history better. He is going out of his way to tell you what happened here. He's giving you context. This person was the Roman emperor, Caesar Augustus. This person is the governor of Syria, Quirinius. This is the first census because there were more, but this is the first one that they took. And we know that they went there to pay taxes, and you probably have heard that. But what you may not know, and Josephus gives us this clue, Josephus is a Jewish historian, that they went there and both Mary and Joseph both had to go because they both came from the line of David, so they both had to return to Bethlehem to pledge allegiance to Caesar Augustus. Uh, they would have been particular 
characters of interest because their son, being from the line of David, would have claimant to the throne of Israel. The, the Maccabean revolt is in the rearview window, and Caesar Augustus does not like the Jews. And so there is political unrest that Jesus is born to, and there is much division and oppression. And as you move into Christmas, we talked week one, you might be sitting around the table with people who do not believe as you. They may have different ideologies as you, maybe even a different faith as you. I can tell you, you know, I've said before from this stage, there's more division than I can remember since I've been alive. It, it seems as though we're looking for things to be divided over. And, and so in some ways, we can even relate to what they were experiencing or, or feeling in that story. And people, it seems, are increasingly hostile to Christians. I, I went to the donut, I was with Nate, we were going, traveling south to, to plan out the year, and we stopped to get donuts. Anybody like donuts? Okay, we don't have any, but uh, we stopped to get donuts, and it was a, a place I had never been to, and there, they had all of the flavors, all of the wonderful flavors, like these were crazy donuts, like not, not your normal donuts, the expensive kind, and, and there was, they had a whole holiday flavor list, and then over here, they had another sign. It was, a, it was the Hanukkah flavor list. And I, and I asked the person, I say, how does the Hanukkah flavor list not fit into the holiday flavor list? And she said, well, it's just, it's just more flavors for Hanukkah. And I go, was there a Christmas flavor list? And she said, no, that would be offensive. And I said, Christmas? Offensive? H help me understand why. She said, I don't know. I told the lady earlier today, Merry Christmas, and she got upset with me. All right? And so we have all of these things that are going on in the peripheral for us to get irritated by, agitated by, to distract us from the baby in the manger. They had to travel. Nazareth to Bethlehem's 90 miles. They're going by foot. This is the distance from Waco to Dallas. They're walking, right? So they... They've got some complicated, I think we have, yeah, there it is. They've got some complications in front of them to go from one place to another. They have to go there for the census to the town where their ancestors were from, where their family lived. Now, some of you, you're guests with us today because you traveled here. You don't live in Waco. You're staying with somebody. Uh, you're in town for the holiday if you will. Some of you, you have travel right in front of you. Like as soon as you leave here, the car's already packed. You've already played Tetris in the back trying to get everything in place. Some of you have already traveled and you've returned home now and, and you're trying to, and, and so you can understand why this time when we're to focus on Jesus, the baby in the manger, we have all of these things to distract. We gotta get, we gotta go. We gotta go. We gotta travel. We gotta get there. Make sure you have the address, the address. know where we're going to stop along the way. It says that there were no room for them in the inn. They had to, so I'm gonna put that one back. I grabbed the wrong one. Mary's pregnant. Complications? It's not Joseph's. She could literally be killed for this. It, it was according to the law. It's hard for us to understand that they, they could take her and they could stone her to death because it seems to the public that she had been unfaithful to the one that she was betrothed to. This is why Matthew says that he was going to leave her quietly because he was a man of honor and he didn't want her to die. He didn't want to shame her. And so they had plans, and then they had changes to those plans. Unforeseen circumstances. Some of you, your Enneagram one, you know, you got it together. You, you know the menu tomorrow, okay? You've already been made. It's in the refrigerator already. You've got plans. You know what time you're going to leave. You know what time people are showing up. You know when you go. You, you know what time you're going to open presents, when, when you're going to do all of the things, you've got your plans together and I want you to know there's going to be some curveballs. 
And I hope they're not hospital visits or anything like that, but there are going to be some things that go wrong. Everybody's got a crazy uncle that shows up or, you know, something, right? You have your unforeseen circumstances. And I don't want it to distract you from the baby in the manger. It starts with Jesus, and it's so easy to end it talking about us. It's his birthday. One year, um, it was my birthday, and Monica was throwing me a surprise party. I didn't know about it, hence the surprise. And, and it was that evening, it was the evening of my birthday, and she had invited all my friends. And, you know, she's not a good liar. And so she was avoiding me like the plague that day. This is a good quality in a spouse to not be a good liar. And, and so I just noticed like on my birthday, she was particularly standoff and this hurt my feelings. I mean, I felt under celebrated. Now in the back of her mind, she's like, no, I know I've got the party planned. It's coming. But I noticed like all of my friends, nobody made a big deal about it. In their minds, they're thinking, hey, we're going to go to your party later. But I didn't know. But nobody, I mean, some of them were like hesitant to say happy birthday because they didn't want me to know that they knew it was my birthday because then they think my, they might know that there's a party and they didn't want to give it away, you know. And so there it was. It was my birthday and I just felt like I, my feelings were hurt that everybody seemed focused on what they had to do. And I think about this, and I'm like, how crazy it is. It's, it's the day we celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ, and we have totally hijacked this with all of the chaos of presence and travel and, and, and everywhere we've got to go and what we've got to do and, and all of the things. And I, I can't help but think, and I'm not trying to shame us. I don't mean for this to be heavy-handed, but I can't help but think, how does God feel about that? Like, like what is he thinking says verse six, while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in clothes, and, or in cloth rather, and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. We often think about the manger like this wooden kind of, you know, cross beam made of wood with some, some hay in it. Um, at, at, even today, you don't see wooden mangers in Israel, but especially in the first century, wood would have been used for cooking and to stay warm. It was not readily available. The manger most certainly would have been a stone trough, just like they are today. It would have been carved out of stone. It would have looked more like this. Now, think about the irony here that they take this brand new baby and they wrap him in swaddling cloths and they place him on a stone platform. This would not happen again until 33 years later when they wrap Jesus in linen cloth and they place him on a stone platform. Luke 22, verse 52 says, Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body. Then he took it down, wrapped it in linen cloth, and placed it in a tomb cut in the rock one in which no one had yet been laid. But why was there a manger? Well, we always think about Jesus staying in a stable. He was born in a stable. But if we study first century architecture, right, the, the house, the people, the living quarters were upstairs. It was just a ledge and there was not a place where you would actually have room to give birth to a child, especially in the guest room. Now, the downstairs was reserved, especially in winter months, for the animals. So the animals would be able to come into the house. I think we have a picture of this, like a home. So there you go. You have that kind of ledge that would have been the, uh, the, the living quarters, right? This room where, that is sometimes translated in. We talk about the innkeeper. The innkeeper saying, hey, there's no room at the end. It's not the word in. It's different than what we see in the story of the Good Samaritan. That word is translated living room or guest room. It's translated correctly here in the NIV. And so they're downstairs where the animals would be, because that's where she would have room to give birth, and they lay him on a stone feeding trough. And as I think about that for us, like what is the connections, I think about the word accommodations. Like with the travel, 
You're trying to figure out where everyone's gonna sleep and hey, you get this bedroom and hey, our family of six will stay in this bedroom and your family of five stays in that bedroom. We'll go to mom's and you know, and hey, there's gonna be blow up mattresses and, and pallets along. We just came back from my mom's for, for Christmas and it was like cousins, all, every, all the cousins, all the guy cousins here, all the girl cousins here, just trying to figure out the accommodations and it adds to some of the chaos and the craziness that makes for our holiday. And then I think about the shepherds. It says, and there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. They were working. We always think about the shepherds as kind of middle-aged men with beards. They were most likely children, teenagers, um, guys and girls, boys and girls, watching over the flocks. And so the angel of the Lord appeared to these shepherds and said, hey, this is what is happening and this is going to be your sign. And as I think about what the shepherds were doing, they were working, they left their work, they were tending the flock. And as I think about distractions for you and I tomorrow, it's the end of the year for you. It's not just the end of the month, at the end of the year, you've got quota, you've got things to do, things to tie up. There's tax implications to consider. And you're gonna have your iPhone and it's gonna be a distraction. And so kids, as just as the shepherds were younger than we think, I wanna incite your help. Children, do I have your attention, guys? Okay, tomorrow, will you help mom and dads focus to remain on Jesus? You're gonna wake up and, and, and what do we get to do in the morning? That's right, sing baby Jesus happy birthday. You nailed it, right? Bake him a cake. Read the story again. Look at the child who came to save us and help them keep their minds off of work because we have so many things to distract us from that. What's not represented in this story here in Luke but is represented in Matthew, as the shepherds came to worship him, we know the Magi came. Now, we don't know exactly when they came. Uh, there are probably more than three, but we always think of three because there were three gifts. One of those gifts being a, an embalming ointment of myrrh, a, a foreshadowing that this baby came to die for you and me. And so as I think about the Magi coming to him, it probably, most likely, much later. We typically, church tradition, celebrate it 12 days later, but it could have been anywhere from 40, to, 40 days to two years later, because we know King Herod killed all of the children, or the, the male children under two. I think about gifts. And so just as you came to church tonight, and we say, hey, don't be distracted by all of the things that you have to do, focus on Jesus, and some of you are like, man, I've got last minute wrapping to do. That's, that's what's gonna happen tonight. We gotta get home, we gotta get the bows, the wrapping paper, we gotta make all of these, these things happen and we're distracted by the gifts. Not for Jesus, but for us. If, to be transparent with you, as I think back through Christmases, what I remember are the gifts. I mean, I remember when I wanted the remote control car called the Lobo, it didn't have this kind of controller, it had this kind of controller, that was, that was a big deal at the time. And I remember when I wanted a scooter, not like a Razor scooter with the rollerblade wheels, but it had like real wheels that you put air on them, like you could take this thing anywhere, and I was so excited to get my scooter. And I remember one year I wanted a Transformer bike. And it wasn't a thing, but I liked Transformers and I wanted a bike. And so my parents transformed my brother's bike into my bike <laughs> and it was some, <laughs> with some paint, you know, and, and I just, I think back on the memories of Christmas and it wasn't so much, hey, here was the story we read, here was the song we sang, I remember learning this about Jesus. It was the gifts. And for some of you, it's the same thing. And, and now, as parents, we've got another shot. Like, we can make it about something different. We can tell them, hey, here's what it's really about and not sell out for the materialism that marks this holiday. I am all for having fun, and I'm all for gifts and Christmas gifts, and we will open them tomorrow too. But we've got to focus on what this day is really about. So they hurried off, verse 16, and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had, they had been told them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. Our job is to do as the shepherds do. If you're here and you're a follower of Jesus Christ, 
you've got a story to tell. And I am amazed at how many people say they believe this story and don't share it. I was talking to someone this week in their 70s, uh, a, a, a person who's been in church their entire life, had great worldly success, have, have built empires, if you will, had, had houses and lake houses and things and all, all of the stuff. I said, hey, can I ask you a question? I said, between one and 10, 10 being certain, one being not so sure. If you died today, how certain are you that you would go to heaven? And he said, a seven. It's exactly what I said 20 years ago and in a moment where God used to change my life. He said, I'm a seven. I'm, I'm and I said, if you stood before God, second question, if you stood before God, he said, why should I let you in? What would you say? And he said, because I've tried hard, I've done good. I, I've sought to be generous with what God has given me. I, 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 this is what I've done. He goes, and then he goes, it's not for me to judge. That's up to God. God's the only one who can judge who gets in. That's my son. That was my son. I love this congregation. As I look out there, I see people that I love dearly. I can't imagine letting him die for you. And if he did, if he did die for you, and to die, like, like you needed a heart, and he said, you know what, Daddy, they can have my heart, and so we put him on the operation table, and we pulled out a heart for you, and then right then you said, nah, I can just be good. I'll just be generous. I'll just try hard. I can't imagine, like as a father, I'm like, wait, what? That's my son. God paid the way for us to be with him forever. Kids, what's his name? How can we be with God forever? What's his name? Jesus. That's right, Jesus. His name is Jesus. And he came like all of these things, these, these distractions, if you will, he was the greatest gift. Jesus is the greatest gift you're ever going to receive. And he did the work for you. You don't need to, you can stop trying so hard to get to him because our God came here. Every other world religion out there is gonna have you trying to work your way up to God. Our God, the one true God, the God of all gods, he came here to rescue you. He did the work. And he says, he tells Thomas, hey, I've gone to prepare a place for you. I've made accommodations for you. That, that's what he's doing right now. He, he has created a place for you in heaven. And his, uncircum, uh, his uh, unseen, unforeseen circumstance, it wasn't unforeseen by him. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. And he came here. I want to talk about travel. He put on humanity and became a human, fully God, fully man. And he's the Prince of Peace, the Lord of Lords. And so as we're talking about division, he is the one that gives true sustaining peace. Every week in this series, we've finished by telling you a story around the nativity. And I'm just gonna stay here in Luke 2 and tell you that we don't have a lot of references of Jesus as a child, just one really. When he's 12 years old, his parents visit the temple and at this time, you would travel communally. So it would be kind of all your friends and family going together. So they go into the temple. And we have one little shot of Jesus' life as a child. And it's here in Luke 2, the same very chapter that we just read from. In verse 44, it says this. It starts like with these words. Thinking he was in their company, they traveled on for a day. Then they began looking for him among their relatives and friends. 
And when they did not find him, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. After three days, they found him in the temple court, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. His mother said to him, son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. And he says, why were you searching for me? Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? It says, thinking he was in their company. Tomorrow, you're gonna wake up, Christmas morning, you're gonna tear into presents, and you're gonna go throughout your day assuming Jesus is in your company. It's all about Jesus, his birthday. But it's not unless you make it about that. And if we're all honest, there's been Christmases where we didn't. And you've got a chance. You have a chance tomorrow to make it about Jesus, because you have relatives, neighbors and friends who are anxiously searching for him. And you know the story. People all throughout Waco and the town that you're visiting from are anxiously searching for him and you know where he can be found. And listen, some of you, you visit us on Christmas and Easter because your life is busy and chaotic and I just wanna invite you home. I'm not mad at you and I'm not here to shame you, but he's found in God's house amongst God's people. And I want to invite you in to belong to a church. And if it's not Harris Creek, find a great Bible teaching church and belong there and serve there and use your gifts there. It changed my life. And so we're going to sing a song. And as we do, we just always at this point in the service do a candlelight. And so I don't want you to, um, I don't want you to, to pull out lighters right now. The, the room's gonna get dark and I want you to feel the angst as the, the flame spreads from right here and it's gonna feel like it takes forever to get up there and I want you to know that there's people in the darkness in the world that are waiting for you to bring that to them, to bring them the hope of Jesus Christ. And so Lord, we just thank you for the gift of a baby in a manger that you put on flesh for us. That you are the solution to our pain, that you are the solution to our suffering, our chaos. And Lord, we just confess that we've made plans in our lives that don't include you. We have rushed on ahead of you, assuming that you were with us, but not taking the time to make you a priority, to fix our hearts and our minds on what you've done for us that Jesus lived a perfect life and died the death that we deserve, giving us the hope of eternal life, not by our own works, but by his. In Jesus' name, amen.